Good morning. I'm Ben Smith, and welcome again to our First Baptist uh, Bible study. We are continuing our last our four, last four weeks. Uh, this week, uh, we begin actually we're beginning a three week, uh, six week study in First John. Uh, this week, we'll be looking at First uh, John chapter one, verses one through um, through uh, chapter two, verse verse two. First um, John was most likely written by the writer of the gospel, though there's some concern from the scholars of who, who the John was. Clearly it was John, but uh, I, I, I think they're pretty, pretty close to it, that most everybody thinks that, that First John, the letters of First and Second and Third John were written by the same writer, John, the, the disciple, that wrote the gospel. So um, let's just assume that as we, as we move through on this study. We'll be looking in First John for the next three, uh, six weeks, a total of six weeks, three, the three weeks finishing out this month and two, three weeks in the beginning of the, of the next month. So let's get started. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father. Now, John is, is, is giving a personal testimony here. Uh, he has been with Jesus um, with, and the other disciples, the, the twelve, for three or three and a half years before the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so he's, he's been able to hear with his own ears and see with his own eyes, he says. And he even says, touched with our hands concerning the Word of God. And what he means by that, I think, is that it's like somebody's touched my life. That he's, he's been able to uh, just observe completely and totally. And, and to see not only what Jesus says, but he was able to watch and see how, what Jesus did and how, how he handled himself and how he seemed to always have the other person in, in, in perspective in his concern. And so he's been able to, to see that and understand that. So he's, he, is, he's, he's, he said, from the beginning, beginning we have heard, we have seen, and we have touched. Um, and so he is, in verse 2, he's saying John is a witness to the people who received this letter that he and other disciples have understood who and what Jesus is. So he is, he is manifesting and what he has seen and what he is testifying to. Now, what is he testifying to? He's, he's proclaiming, having received and understood. Now John wants to proclaim his truth to those who are receiving this letter. He's experienced it himself, and, he, and he's, 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 saying, he's talking about the principle of, of proclaiming it. Once you hear that gospel, there's a desire to, to share that gospel. So he wants to proclaim it. And what is he proclaiming? He's proclaiming eternal life. That's, that's what he wants to talk about. He says, um, <clears throat> proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Now the us there are the disciples. And the you there are the people he's writing the letter to. And, and to you and I as uh, uh, modern day believers. <clears throat> And in verse 3, he says, The same relationship that John and the other disciples experienced with Jesus is available to all who respond to God's love. Look, look at it. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim. There's that word proclaim again. Uh, and we'll see it again on several occasions as we move through this scripture. Also to you. And again, the you are the people and you and I to, to, in modern day so that you may have fellowship. Um, <clears throat> Now, the, John is beginning to establish a principle here in scriptural, scriptural principle. And the pr principle is that fellowship with believers cannot be a separate fellowship than the fellowship with the Father. They are one in, in the same. Look, look at what he says in, in, in verse 3. Too many have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ, the, the Christ, the Messiah. And so he ties that fellowship <clears throat> with, the, with the believers, he ties that to the relationship they have uh, with Jesus. 
Now, what he's, the principle is, is you cannot love God and hate your brother. That's a, that's a principle. That's a scriptural principle that he's going to drive home with that. Um, and he's, he says that. Look, again, fellowship with us and with the Son, of, uh, with the Son Jesus the Christ. Um, he's, he's, he's driving that point home that you, you can't love God and, and hate your brother. <clears throat> and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, this is fascinating because the, think about this. The greatest joy of a good deal is sharing it with whoever, whoever will listen. You buy a new lawnmower, and it mows your grass beautifully well. You buy a new computer, and it works well. But where's the real joy? It's telling what a good deal you got. And, and, and what's the use of getting a good deal if you don't get to share it? And, and the thrill is of sharing that good deal. And so this is that same principle that John's talking about in verse 4. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. It's, a, it's fun to share the gospel. Uh, and, it's, and it's like you've received some message that's just life-changing, obviously. That's the gospel. And so there's a joy in sharing that. And it's the same kind of joy that you get when you, have a good, you get a good deal and you take an opportunity to, to someone who will listen to it and you want to tell them about that good deal. And there's great joy in that experience. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, John sees darkness as sin in his letter and light as the absence of sin. Now, there is no sin in God and in Jesus who was born of woman. That's a, a, a marvelous term that we see in Scripture, that, we are, that Jesus was born of woman. He was the only begotten son. That is, he's the only born of woman, son of God. Paul really enlightens us in that in, his, in Galatians 4, chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman. So, you see, born of woman meant that God, God is the creator, the God of creation. And the creator has the, of anything, whether it's art or whether it's the world, the creator has the inalienable right of definition. Whatever that creator calls something or defines something, that's the way it is. And God has set forth the, the terms and conditions for salvation. And he will not change the law. Uh, the minute he changes the law, he's not being dishonest to the people who, who abided by the law. So he will not change the law. So what God did was he left heaven and came to earth, born of woman, in order to be and have an opportunity to sin. And by having that opportunity of sin, he identified with us. And when he identified with us as being born of woman and then didn't sin, now he's the only human that's ever lived that was capable of dying for someone else's sin because he didn't have sin of his own. So that, that little phrase that Paul uses here, uh, but when the fulfill, fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. God himself became a human and was born of woman. And that's so significant because that's the basis of how God is going to fulfill the law rather than changing the law in order to make us acceptable to him. John gives us, uh, going back to John now, that was Paul in Galatians and his letter to the Galatians. Now we get back in 1 John. John gives us the concept that God's light is more powerful than the sin in the world in his gospel, in, in the gospel of, of John. Uh, when he says in his first verse, chapter, verses four, and, first chapter, verse, excuse me, verses four and five, he says, "In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it." So uh, here he's 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 equating that. He says, "The life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it." Now, think for a minute. The smallest amount of light will dispel the greatest amount of darkness. If we take a room that's completely dark and we light one candle, nowhere in that room can you not see that candle. You may not have enough light to read the newspaper, but you, there's no amount of darkness that will snuff out 
the light that comes from that candle. And so what, what Paul, John is, is, is talking about is this idea and this, uh, this principle of proclamating the gospel and bringing joy to us and that it is the light of the world and nothing can, can snuff that out. The smallest amount of light will dispel the greatest amount of darkness. <clears throat> If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Now, um, in verse 5, going back to verse 5, God uh, is, de is described as light, and if God is light, then to walk in darkness means to live without God. That's what John is trying to say here. Uh, if we say we have fellowship with him, that's God, and we walk in darkness, we're lying. We do not practice the truth. <clears throat> so we cannot claim a relationship with God, that, be, that is being saved in salvation, and live in darkness. Um, we just can't do it. That, that those, those two things are mutually exclusive. You, you can't live in sin and, and, be, and be saved. And so John is making that very clear, and he, he's using it in terms of fellowship. Now, hang on to that word, because that's going to have some meaning to us as we move along. Fellowship with him um, we, while we walk in darkness, is a, to, to say that we're doing that is a lie, and we cannot, we cannot do that. <clears throat> Then in verse 7, in concert, contrast to living in the darkness without Jesus, if we know Jesus as Lord, then we have a fellowship with all other believers. Um, look at verse 7. But if we walk in light, now God is light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And with the, um, so let's just stop right there. See, <clears throat> remember we talked about that we can't have we can't love God and hate our, our, our brother. And he, this is that same principle, but he's stating it a little differently. That we, we walk in light, we walk under the fellowship and under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that gives us fellowship with who? With one another uh, and with the other, other believers. The redemptive work that Jesus did on the cross, that's the blood he's going to talk about here, brings forgiveness of the believer's sins. Look at that. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So that um, uh, we, are, we are sinful, uh, and, but God cleanses us of that sin and gives us capability of being in God's presence. And he does that through the redemptive activity that Jesus occurred on the cross with his, with his blood, by shedding his, his own blood. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Whoa. What's he saying now? He just got through saying that if we have sin, that we can't, if we have sin, we can't be in the fellowship. And then he turns around in verse 8, and he says, the person who is walking in the light, as opposed to the walking in darkness, is not without sin. And what I think he's saying is, is that, so he says that if, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Now, um, he, that seems to be a conflict. But the truth of the matter is we're living in imperfect bodies, and we're living in an imperfect world. And so what he's saying to us is, is that the, the, <clears throat> the, the difference, however, it, between the one who's just living in sin and without salvation and the one who is living in the light with, with, with the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, but still must deal with sin in his life, is, is that while the person who is walking in the light has sin in their lives, they are not living in unconfessed sin. So they're dealing with their sin. And what um, the presence of unconfessed sin in a believer's life breaks the fellowship. Now, I, I told you to watch for that word, that word fellowship with God, but does not destroy their justification in Christ's salvation. So here's a believer that's saved and that his sins have been forgiven, and so he must, but he, and he's on the road, and he's, he's been justified, 
in Christ, and he is also being sanctified. First Thessalonians 4, um, chapter 4, verse 24 says that we are, that he is sanctifying us at the, so that at the, at, the, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be found perfect. Um, so we are beginning to look more like what we have been declared to be. That's sanctification. Uh, we've not yet been glorified, though. That, that comes at, uh, at the second advent. So <clears throat> he's saying, um, that here's the believer that must deal with the sin in his life, even though he's a believer. Well, how does he do that? And then he, we come forth with verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, this ought to be the Pledge of Allegiance for every Christian, I think. Because what's the function here? We, let's look at this verse in terms of what do we do and what does God do and why does he do it? Well, what do we do? We confess our sin. Um, God's Holy Spirit, um, to the unbeliever, God's Holy Spirit is conviction. I mean, is con- condemnation. But Paul says in Romans Chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are in his his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. That was Paul's favorite term for us, being in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So no longer can we be condemned as a believer. But the Holy Spirit's function to the believer's life is conviction. Conviction is totally different than, 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 <clears throat> than being convicted, and than being um, uh, set, um, being, uh, there's no for there any condemnation. So that's totally different than, than conviction. Conviction is what happens when the Lord says to us through the Holy Spirit, something in your life is not right. You're not, there's sin in your life. And so what our responsibility is, is to confess. Now notice we don't ask for forgiveness. In this verse. Why? We've already been forgiven. We've already been justified. There's no, that's signed, sealed, and delivered your salvation is. But here we are in the process of being sanctified, and God's involvement with that is to convict us as his Holy Spirit, convict us for sin in our lives. And what our response for it is, is that we confess those sins as he reveals them to us. And what does God do? Because God is faithful, faithful, and just, that's the attributes of God. That's, he is a faithful God, and he is ultimately just just. Everything he does will be just, and we can be confident in that. And, and because he is faithful and because he is just, he will forgive. There are two things that are important here. He forgives and he cleanses. And those are important two things. We confess sin as, as believers, having been saved. We confess sin God is faithful, and he's just, and he therefore forgives us of that sin, and then he cleanses us of that sin. And what that does, if we are cleansed of unrighteousness, then we are what? We are righteous. And if we are righteous, isn't that our target? Isn't that our objective? We want to be righteous. We must be righteous before we can be in God's presence. And we are not righteous when we have unconfessed sin, but how do we get to that righteousness? We, we confess that sin, God's faithful and just to forgive us of that, sin, of that sin and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, we are righteous, and if we are righteous, then we are acceptable to God and can in His presence, therefore, have fellowship with Him. So that we have, when we have sin that's unconfessed as a believer in our lives, it breaks our fellowship with Him. We don't feel like we are saved sometimes. Um, but but we're not, we're not challenging our salvation, we're challenging our fellowship. <clears throat> to summarize, when a believer sins and they confess that sin, God forgives and he restores the fellowship. They've never lost their salvation or our salvation. We've lost that fellowship. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, here's the principle of Scripture. Because verse 10, it just restates something he's already said. John restates the concept in verse 8 and 9 that the believer must deal with the sin in his life. And the principle is, is when God wants us to know something, 
all the way through the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament, he says it more than once. Sometimes he says it two or three times. And in this passage, John, God says through John as he's writing this letter, look, here's the, here's the principle I want you to understand, and I'm going to tell it to you again. So in verse 10, he almost, almost says it verbatim, almost. Look at verse 8 and 9 again. If we say we have no sin, if we say we have not sinned, that's almost the same language, just a little bit. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in verse 10, He's just repeating that. And the principle is, that's important. When God wants us to know something, and He wants us to, hey, hey, what He's saying to us is, look at here, listen up. I got something really important to say to you. Verily, verily, is what he says in King James. I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you. And here's what it is. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, liar, and his word is not in us. Therefore, there's something you need to do for that sin. You need to deal with that sin in your life, even as a believer. In God's gospel, he tells us, going back to, God, God, in, to the gospel of John, he tells us, in his word, uh, what, who the word is. And let's look at that. In John chapter 1 again, but let's look at verses 1 and 2. In the beginning and, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what I want us to see there is that Jesus is the Word, and that Jesus is God, and that He was with God, He was in the beginning of God, He is the... It's work when we start looking at our lives and we're saying, what is it in our life, Father, that, that needs to be dealt with? Where, where is the sin in my life? Where, where is something that I need to confess? I'm not sure God shows us all of our sin, but it's what He shows us, we've got an obligation to work at, therefore confess it. And that's what I mean by work. He makes it clear. Uh, look at that. Little, my little children, that's what John calls the church at this time. I am writing to you these things so that you may not sin. Well, we, there needs to be a process. We need to look more like we have been declared to be uh, justified. We need to look more like that tomorrow than we did today. And that's, that's work, and that's confession, and that's seeking God's face and, and letting the Holy Spirit show us what is in our life needs to be, needs to be dealt with. The operative word here is if one sins, then Jesus is totally capable to advocate for us in that he was completely righteous. There's that word righteous again. Remember what God does for us when, he, when we confess he's faithful and just to cleanse us from what? All what? Unrighteousness. Therefore, we are righteous. And here is, here is Jesus who is completely righteous. So we have fellowship because he and I are 
are righteous because of our confession of our sin and dealing, working at and dealing with the, the sin in our lives. <clears throat> Jesus is being totally adequate in righteousness is our atonement before the Father. Look at that. He is our perpetuation for our sins. He is substituted for our sins. He couldn't do that unless he had the opportunity to sin and then didn't sin. And therefore, I can't pay for your sins because by the time I pay for my own sins, what does it cost me? It cost me my life. But Jesus was tempted like as we are in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse, verse 15. Tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And therefore, he was able, for with his death, to pay the penalty and transfer the result of it to us because he had not sinned. But he was, had the opportunity to sin. <clears throat> The cross provides the opportunity for the world, the whole world, to receive eternal life. Now, John, he makes a hyper jump here. He's been talking about how it relates to each of us as individuals, as believers. And he's not writing to the Billy Graham crusade now. He's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. And, and then all of a sudden he says this hyperlink. He says the cross, um, he says he is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, he's saying that Jesus died for the whole world. Now, this is not universal salvation. This is universal availability for salvation. It requires our response to it. But it's saying that because of the redemptive activity of Jesus on the cross, we now have <clears throat> all the whole world, anyone, can have access to God's fellowship and become righteous. John moves to the impact of the cross on the unredeemed man and eternal life is available to anyone confessing Jesus as his Lord. Well, what can we learn from this, from this verse? First of all, because we live in an imper imperfect bodies, we have sin in our lives as believers. Now, face it, we do. Sin is anything that, does, that, that we do that damages our relationship with God, with other people, and even ourselves. Um, it damages our, our walk with, with the Lord. Secondly, sin is destructive in our lives, and we should not be complacent about dealing with it. Um, if we just kind of rock along and we don't deal with it, we will, we will face the consequences. The answer, no, thirdly, the answer of dealing with sin in our lives is to confess it and receive forgiveness for it as believers. Um, uh, we, we must deal with that sin. And when God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. And that's an important principle. That we've got to forgive ourselves. And secondly, uh, if we have offended other persons, we need to forgive them. Or if they've offended us, we need to, um, um, we need to accept their forgiveness or ask for their, for their forgiveness for us. So, um, for the believer... Unconfessed sin breaks the fellowship with God. It does not take away one's salvation. When we lose our fellowship with God and our fellow believers, it may seem like we are never, never saved. Think about the children of Israel. They came out of Egypt, and they were all excited, and God wanted to save them from the bondage. For 430 years, they'd been in bondage. And he saved them from that bondage. And he said, I want you to get the Ten Commandments, and then I want you to hightail it up and go into the Promised Land. And they got up there, and they said, uh, we don't think we got enough faith to get in the Promised Land. And so that generation spent 38 to 40 years wandering around in the uh, southern tip of, Mount Sin uh, of the Sinai Peninsula and never saw the Promised Land. The, in fact, they got to the point that they asked Moses if they could go back to Egypt because they could eat onions and garlic and some other, uh, something that didn't sound very good to me. They were acting like they had not been saved from the bondage of Egypt. Now think about the Christian. God wants to save us not only from sin, but he wants to save us into abundant life. And so if we're not willing to, to make that work and conf of confession and working with the sin in our lives, then we could be like the, the Hebrews that came out of Egypt, saved from the bondage of Egypt, but never experiencing the, the experience of the promised land. That entire generation died. And now the second generation was the one that under Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land. 
John 1, 7. Keep that. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that truth, for the truth of the fact that, first of all, you have given to us eternal life through, through yourself, through your son, and through his redemptive activity on the cross. And secondly, Father, as believers, you give to us a way to deal with the sin in our lives and the imperfection of our bodies and the world in which we live. And that we, when we confess, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.